The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name's Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of the Andrew Room Podcast. I'm joined today with a gentleman I've known for a few years. And he's going to talk your ear off about basketball. So I've given him a 75% content limit to do with basketball metaphors. He's been in financial services for many years and built a great business up on the Gold Coast. Hugh Robertson, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Roxy. Very happy to be here. And it's bright and early. So we are both caffeine field. Now, you've been doing this for quite some time. A quick look at your LinkedIn. I think it's been over a dozen years or so that you've run this business which is Sensual Financial Services in the Gold Coast. Maybe give us a bit of a feel of how you ended up doing that. Um, you're also not that much of an older guy, but you've got quite a lot of years under your belt. Were you always interested in financial planning? Was there a family connection? You know, maybe give us just a little bit of your backstory. Yeah, so I, I suppose when I went to uni, I started in law. That's Robertson's had kind of always done law. And when I was speaking to my dad, he kind of questioned why I did it. And I just thought, well, that's what we all do. Uh, and he- so sorry, sorry, your dad's all there? Yeah. Yeah, so he basically cross-examined you. I think that's the best terminology. <laughs> Effectively, yes. And we, he kind of sort of said he never really had that passion for it, which really then led me on a journey to find something just through university courses, what I was passionate about. And finance, the investing side of finance really appealed to me in that it is black, it's not black and white. There is gray area. There's always going to be, it's always going to be dynamic. And there'll always be challenges. So I kind of gravitated towards that space and walked out with a international finance degree, which is now just a commerce degree, uh, and then into a grad program with Commonwealth Bank. So I was one of their graduate intakes and amazing opportunity out of university to get into something like that and met my future wife there. So that's definitely the highlight for me. But three years there and got very early exposure into advice, probably too soon in, in hindsight. Um, that was 2004. I started as a graduate, 2005 as an advisor. And then as, as we went through that journey, uh, someone said you should be at your first role for at least three years. Otherwise, it looks bad on your resume. So I stayed there three years and one month uh, and then off to Whitaker McNaught. So, and for me, that was the home of financial advice. And I thought that would have been my forever home uh, because I've just got so much respect for Noel Whitaker and Cheryl McNaught and what they tried to do for financial advice and for poor people. When you talk to them, they really did believe in helping people and there wasn't sales targets or things like that. So great environment. And look, I think those guys, along with Paul Clitheroe back in the day, really demystified and brought financial planning to the general public in a positive way. And that- I think also back then, there was probably easier to do. Nowadays, you might try, but there's a lot of general advice disclaimers that goes with everything. So uh, that that was a really great place for me who was, might have been a bit disenchanted about what I thought financial advice was after the bank experience. They were really great at sales and helping people, but it wasn't quite what I wanted to align myself with. Whitaker McNaught was great, but then when the GFC hit, uh, Whitaker McNaught, who had sold to Halifax Bank of Scotland, who also owned Bankwest, 
sold to CBA. So there, there was no going back to the mothership for me. So that then was what led to Central Financial Services in 2009. So you've started this business November 2009. Did you think at least the markets can't get lower? Is that correct? Yeah, or forever an optimist uh, or a fool, one of, one of the two. But it, it, it was really that I wanted to build something that would have my signature on it. Uh, good or bad, I'm always happy to wear it. But I just, the way I had said, I had seen how it had been done so well with Whitaker McNaught, I effectively just wanted to create a mini Whitaker McNaught or a 2.0 of that. So there were some accountants who sort of put their businesses together, their financial advice business was very small. And unbeknownst to me, they'd done a lot of unlisted property. So I kind of walked out of Whitaker McNaught where we'd had just normal market volatility during the GFC into a, another storm of unlisted property. So again, that probably took three years to unwind all that for clients. And that was a really interesting point of having to unwind a lot of positions for people that you never invested. Someone else did. So that's at an early age, I learned to take accountability or responsibility, even if it wasn't my fault, because the goal was the clients were upset, the clients were scared, the clients were uncertain about their future. So that was a really nice moment for me to realize they weren't yelling or crying at me. It was something that we just needed to fix for them. And I think that's kind of really set the direction for Centaur in terms of client service and client focus going forward. So since you started off small, as you say to yourself, and it's now grown over the last sort of four or five years, what were some of the key moments or milestones or even some of the people that may have helped you get past that part of the journey? I think fundamentally like a basketball team, and that's and you only get five minutes on basketball, so off you go. Yeah, you're only as good as your team. So we we talk a lot nowadays about a, a race car team, and if it's if it takes three people to change the tires in one second, but the fourth person to change in three seconds, what's our time? It's three seconds. So it's not we don't get to average out, uh, especially when you're a small team. The people component is the most important, and I think the, what I've learned is. Different people to different sizes of the business. Early on, I had very efficient people and really good at just getting through a large volume of work, uh, but they might not have necessarily been the people that were going to help us scale or, or grow when you start incorporating more team members and things like that. So you'll often hear us talk about Central 1.0 and 2.0. This is the office today. So when did the one turn into the two? Uh, probably around 2018, 19, uh, once we started to get a bit of that scale really came through. We had fixed all the unlisted property issues. We had started to grow more of a professional office. And, and that's also turning from a family to a sports team. A lot of people will say, you know, we're a family, we're a family. Some of the times the problem with a family, I've got four young children. It's mum and dad do everything. The kids get to do all the fun stuff. We go to the kids' parties, we go to kids' sports. And I kind of had that, you know, brain moment where I went, well, hang on, this doesn't work. We need we need direction, we need strategy, we need vision. So that's where we went to now with the sporting team. So the family, mum and dad ended up having to do everything. Now as a sports team, everyone's got clear accountabilities, clear lines of sight into what they have to do. So 18, 19 is where we really start to turn a corner and the growth as a result really started to to ramp up unint- unintentionally. And you mentioned you've got yourself and your lovely wife have four children. Under what age? So I've got a nine, seven, five, and three-year-old. Okay, okay. For, for everyone who's listening, they just let out a collective gasp at that. And I've noticed, just by looking at the wonderful people on your website, that it looks like a lot of your team members are also going through that life stage. Is that by design or just the way it's panned out? The, the people that we've built uh, share our values. So for, for them, it is going to be their, their aligned trying to achieve their lines of our family values where you know we really try and fit work into our life and you, you hear this often talk about not liking to work because if we don't have them fully engaged in in what they're doing outside of work they're not going to be fully engaged in what they're doing inside of work and i haven't asked this question before i'm actually going to now put into all of my questions when i'm dealing with people with young kids if i was to ask your children what their parents did for a living what do you think they'd say uh, my kids will say that I help people, uh, and we we're very intentional with with the words that we use with our children in in everything because uh, we we don't want them to talk money or <laughs> or things or things of that nature. And we really want to build that that fabric within them of well, you know, we have our work base, but as 
we have our own sort of Robertson values that we try to instill in our children about kindness, generosity, uh, work, hard work, ethic, work ethic, and really build that self confidence that, and this is a professional thing as well, that if you do all the right inputs, the outputs will take care of themselves. Yep, yep, yep. So you're right. I mean, it's a progression. You don't just get an outcome that happens overnight. And if you do, potentially, there's been a corner cut somewhere. So in relation to the business at the moment, you're located on the Gold Coast and you've been there. Are you a born and bred Gold Coast person? No, I grew up in uh, the Hawkesbury area in in Sydney and at 18. So I finished year 12 up here on the Gold Coast. Always, You went to school. He's on a one-way ticket. Love it. Yes, basically. And then I, I figured I was always going to end up back down in Sydney, but then you did university, you're playing your state league basketball, which keeps you here. And uh, it kind of, then I got a graduate program, got to play on the Gold Coast, got, you know, financial. so I always intended to go to Sydney. And then probably, you know, six years into my career, I, I kind of felt there's not a better place in the world than the Gold Coast. And if I could build a really successful business here, I would really get the best of both worlds. And especially with young family, you sort of every opportunity is available to them here. And yeah, we, we're more Southern Gold Coast. I really think it's just one of the world's best kept secrets. Wonderful people, relaxed lifestyle, but very successful as well. Okay. Look, lucky we don't have many, many listeners. Um, we don't want anyone discovering that that secret that you may or may not have just shared intimately with yourself. But now actually back to the business, which is cool. You mentioned that you're not a family business, but you deliberately wanted to make sure it wasn't linked to you as a person, was there a motivation behind that? Uh, definitely. I have seen a lot of previous businesses and, you know, you you look around at all your competitors and there was always a little bit of inherent ego in that, I felt, and you always made it about you. Uh, Centaur, being that I'm from a team sport background, uh, I've always been very intentional that this business isn't about me. And even if you look at now, two of our young advisors, Bobby and Nick, they're superstars of the industry and they're going to be amazing. And I've really loved helping people and being being the rock star advisor, but I'm also loving now being that coach and mentor. And it really gives me a lot of energy seeing these guys grow. And you know, if you name the business after yourself, you kind of limit the opportunity to do that. Oh, look, I agree. And look, some people are... Um you know, startled with that because it's an intergenerational brand. But if that works, um, that's great. But if it's Greenfields, you've got the option of probably, you know, starting afresh, which I think is sage advice. Now, this is an engineering room podcast. And um, we're talking earlier, I had a look at your website. And like a lot of financial planning practice, you've got your partner involved in the business and you're working with your much better heart. And you've also got a lady called Kelly, who's known as the head of people and culture. And when I asked you, you know, when we're looking about the succession for the engine room style person, you said, well, it's going to be a combination. I'd love to hear your thoughts or vision on that particular role in your business. It took us a long time to get to this spot. We Everyone kind of thinks about the business development, how to get more referral sources, how to get, you know, more leads and all of that. And I've kind of flipped it on its head a little bit in my own thinking and thought, if I can just get the best people and be your most important resource. So we need someone who's going to manage, manage that and their their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations and, and really build out their capabilities. So can't afford three second pit stops. Can't you cannot afford and if you are doing three second pit stops, your other three guys who are doing one second pit stops will leave. So that's probably been our evolution that we can't have. You know, we talk about eight players and at Central we wanna really just feed them the number one, the desirable spot for the A players. Now, an A player is going to have to do a lot more work, um, but they're going to be working in an autonomous environment. They're going to be self-directed. They're going to take accountability. So our evolution has been that if we can get those guys and not have the Cs, or even, you know, you look at, I know you're a fan of scaling up as I am, and, you know, that if we've got that attitude and those core values right on, on one, one axis, and on the on the across axis, you know the x axis, the performance. We really want those guys that are doing the high performance and high values. But if we have to choose between a performance or values, we'll always choose values because we can train the performance. We can teach people coach. So it's changeable. And and Kelly's been amazing. At if anyone ever gets the opportunity to meet Kelly, uh, it's a shot in the arm of energy and positivity and an unrelenting focus on client service and. 
that's our industry. We've we had this industry fatigue going through the ten years of change, all the regulatory changes, both uh, you know royal commissions, and I think sometimes we forgot about clients. So with with all that and that no one's fault, that's just what happens. So we've really re-engaged in, all right, let's focus on our people and make sure they're focusing on their clients. And that's going to create a bit of a Jim Collins flywheel effect for us. So if we're doing great service, great advice, that's going to lead to more clients, um, more service. So we'll be able to really grow by by service. And everyone talks about strategy-wise, what's your differentiation? And they try to come up with these weird and wonderful things. Sometimes it can be as simple as returning phone calls quickly. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Look, you've just given a couple of nuggets of gold there. And I might just uh, like to add to uh, Kieran, the sound guy, make sure we've got the Jim Collins link. And no doubt, um, we've got a lot of people who also would love the Rockefeller Habits by Vern Harnish. Um, as you rightfully mentioned, I'm a massive fanboy of both of those. Probably one of the critical sliding door moments of my life when I embraced that in about 2005. Yeah. Well, it got us focusing on people first. And I think all of us, I'm a big dreamer. So I was always dreaming how to make the biggest advice and best advice practice ever and it really just got back got me back to the point of focusing on our people and growing our people and if i grow their capability that's well then you go seven habits of highly effective people so you know that production that production capability this is we've just been through this exercise we want people age 50 over 50 plus typically we're looking at 750 to 2.5 million in investable assets uh so that fits the life stage pre-post retiree they're concerned do they have enough to retire on how are they going to do retirement? Will they get age pension? What are they going to do with their adult children? Intergenerational wealth transfer? Are they going to get age pension? Estate planning consequences? So we can really be number one in Australia in that. And we've really worked hard at building our capability to be the number one there with a very focused strategy. And what that will lead is when there are the young accumulators that come in, uh, we'll help them. We'll have referral sources to lenders, to uh, insurance guys. And we'll build out our, our external capability, but we might still run the point on it. So because the strategic advice component is still vital, but we might not, you know, I heard uh, Ray Dalio say, you know, you need, we need the right answers, but we don't need to be the person with the right answer. So we can find those right people to help our clients and then we just the connector. Yeah, there's two points on that that I'm seeing in the tapestry of answers uh, in my travels as part of the engineering. And I think increasingly, financial planning business, want about to offer all the services, but don't necessarily have the engineering for every single discipline. Because your client wants the Netflix experience, and they want to bounce from high professionalism and high user experience from one to the other. And as long as you're the strategic owner of a relationship, it doesn't matter if you bring in other specialists, like a doctor and a GP, sorry, a doctor and a specialist. I love. Well, I think it's also do what you're good at. If you're not good at it, there's people better than it. And if you remove your sort of professional ego out the way, I want the best outcome for a client. So if there's a better person at insurance than me, I should refer to them and my client will get a better outcome. So you've got clients age 50 and above and having a quick look at your team, looks like the average age is about 10 to 15 years younger than that. Is that a selling point? So are you saying to your clients that you want to be able to look after them long after they're retired? Um, you know, my team are in the prime of their, their life or has it just been accidental? Absolutely intentional. That's absolutely one of our selling points to clients is that we will see you through your retirement. Uh, most people, we understand that 50-year-olds would feel comfortable joining up with someone their own age. Uh, but if they've done their job well as a financial advisor, they should be retiring before their clients. It gives you a lot of comfort when you see how smart your advisors are and they're asking you really technical questions and you, uh, oh, yeah, I think it's this. Uh, no, they're, they're definitely bright. They're definitely capable. And we, as we transition myself and, and the existing clients who have joined me initially back in the early days and letting them know that these guys are the future and they're amazing. And then it's, then it's up to those guys to really earn that relationship. But certainly most, most new advice clients come going forward, they're coming in straight to Bobby and Nick. Well, let's talk about, you know, um, I suppose the first question is, is how do you get your clients? I mean, do you have a network? Um, you do sort of have a B2C presence. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, how do people come to the front door of your business? Marketing's probably been the hardest thing for me to do because, you know, you never want to be a, a big noter or anything like that. So everything, we try and invert everything. And we always thought that if we give amazing service, clients will refer. 
And if you went through, the majority of our business grew that way, just through just really good service, really good communication, always talking to clients, open door policy for meetings. Um, and then we went down the SEO path and really spent some time on our website and building out the content in that. And You've got uh, detailed life goals, life stages, and you're giving a lot of content away to the universe. And, you know, hey, I hope you got some call to actions from that. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. So 75% of our, our work would come from the work that comes in the door would come from uh, Google nowadays. And that's not necessarily the marketing, the advertising spend. We do spend on the Google ads, but it's mostly organic. And then from our existing clients, that's probably the remaining uh, 10, 15%. Oh, 10, 15%. And then 10 is from some professional referral sources. We don't have tie ups with them. It's just that we've served their clients or we've got mutual clients and they send stuff to us. So, so you guys are managing about 360. About 360 at the minute. Uh, and, you know, really trying to work on the, the efficiency piece through software that everyone, we're all looking for that, you know. So let's dig into the efficiency. So maybe get an idea, give me an idea of the organizational structure. You know, have the advisors got their own remit of clients? How do you run advice, delivery, those sorts of things? It'd be good to get a feel for, you know, if I was to join you as a team member, um, alternative, for instance, you know, if I was out there and wanted to, you know, offer more services or might be merging with you, you know, how does it look? How, how does it look? It's a great question. From our perspective, we've got a pod structure. We have a pod structure within the, for each advisor. So for example, Bobby and Caitlin will work together as a, as a close team and Nick and Mathene will work as a close team. Uh, we've then got an in-house power planner. So again, that's one of our uh, competitive advantages that we have the ability to run modeling quickly at, at a high level. Well, and we talk about client experience. So even with the pod structure, the reason we've done that is then our team knows how to work together with each other well. There's a clear pathway in terms of career progression. If you want to go down that pathway from client service officer into your PY into advisor, there's going to be a capacity to do that. And how we're going to, I suppose one of our, our secret goals is we're going to build the diamond team structure. I was only talking to Ben Calder from Adelaide the other day and um, he was telling me he was doing exactly the same uh, kind of structure. Maybe you know each other. Um, if not, might be worth doing a quick, quick intro because the philosophy is very sound. Um, be good if you could take us through it for listeners. So effectively, if I'm a young advisor start out or I'm out of university, I'm typically going to walk into an advice practice as a client service kind of role. And, and that's really important that you understand that role and that you do your time in that role. Uh, because one day you are going to be a senior advisor and you want to walk the walk so you can have the respect of people and understand what everyone does within the team. So you might start there and then you might work your way into an associate advisor role. Uh, so you start to really move in that direction, which will then be into your PY. So you might be doing from client service to associate advisor. So as the associate advisor or PY, you're now getting exposure into meetings, you're doing your meeting minutes, you're doing a lot more follow-ups. And then you build yourself into your own financial advisor. And from there, you're now kind of head of your own team almost, or you could still be reporting to a senior advisor. It's almost like the accounting partnership model. I'm seeing how they've done it. And I suppose with the evolution of the professional year, it gives a bit more rigor and timeframes around that rather than some people think they can do it in six months and others thinking it's 10 years. There's almost a prescriptive period of time where you can start here and work your way through, isn't there? I feel we need that in the industry because we're all ambitious and we all want to be in the role as quick as possible, but you've got to go through some stuff, you know, some market experience, having some bad things happen to clients to learn the soft skills. It's not just about technical skills and we've really got to give give these younger advisors or, you know, associate advisors exposure in the meeting room so they get how to handle those conversations and how not to have the empathy, have have those soft skills to really listen and understand what the client's really saying and what their real concerns are. So by working with a diamond team structure, you're going to get that exposure. And it's also great for the people at the top of the, the top of the diamond because they're going to learn their leadership. So it's going to be another skill set for those guys as future leaders of our business. Grow grow your pod first and grow your team. And then, you know, these guys will be very influential for the future growth of Centaur. And look, just looking at a uh, pinch point, in uh, your business, you've got 360 uh, sort of family groups, as you mentioned, um, and uh, you've got your power planner, R Renee. And um, um, look, oh, I was wondering, how does she get through all of that work? Um, that's just existing clients. 
Um, and you no doubt see them two or three times a year, um, just to just to keep those clients. So um, you're also attempting to attract, you know, new clients through Google and whatnot. It's pretty hectic. She runs pretty hard. We're very we work a lot on our our processes and how we get more efficient, so that really she's not entering a lot of the data into the system. That's all for her. So you know, we really want to use people's best talents where they're suited. So I don't want Renee, and just from a business point of view, I don't want to be paying her her hourly rate versus some administration person at their hourly rate. I'd rather they enter the data and then Renee takes and just writes the SOA. So that, that's been okay as through just process. And if we gave her 10 new clients in a week, she wouldn't be happy with us, but, but she'd get through it. And I think ultimately as the business grows, that will be a maybe more of an outsourced solution. And then we talk about this diamond team structure and she'd probably be head of her diamond team and we might have an outsourced solution that she would oversee. So you've got the pod structure, which is soon to be the diamond structure. We're actually running out of American sports, by the way. I'm expecting some sort of ice hockey HR principle at the end of this, which won't be overly instructive. But so you've got your advice, you've got your delivery done, you've got your client service offices. Domestically, you've got some help with people doing the repetitive tasks. You're building that one team culture which I'm going to get into the people and culture later on and maybe get a feel for how you build a culture in a workplace, which although you're not geographically concentrated, you can, you've can you got people at home, you've got people overseas, et cetera. I was also wondering, you know, what's the cadence of how you guys run every day? You know, does the pod lead it? Does each advisor lead it? Is there head of a diamond? You know, what's the accountability and do they have their own P&Ls? Do they run independently or is it sort of fixed, you know, like, How's it work? Uh, meeting rhythms are uh, uh, vital to us. So we, all of us, meet every morning and we, and we go through, you know, what we've got on our plate, what our stocks are, things like that. So that's just to keep everything moving forward. Uh, and the pods will meet daily as well. So about what, what they've got to do individually. Uh, the advisors as heads of their pods are accountable to certain numbers. They, they know what they need to manage. Uh, they, know, they know their targets really well. And we kind of celebrate, we have our celebrations when a client signs up, that, that's not a bad thing. And we sort of feel that that's a dirty word sometimes. We celebrate that because it's someone else who's now trusted you on their journey to hit their life goals and all of this. So we should reward that. And so we just, we have our number, you know, we want to add 25 ideal clients per quarter. And we've got, you know, we track every time we do it, we go print it out again, slap it on the wall and we, we talk about it. And celebrate the wins. Absolutely. And, you know, part of working in a remote kind of fashion is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious to say slap it on the wall, then you get other people working from home, you get overseas, you know. I was wondering, do you run like a Microsoft platform or, or how do you, you know, do you use MS Teams? What, what sort of tools do you use? So tech stack is we're running through uh, Office 365, you know, including obviously Teams, Outlaw, SharePoint. Uh, we utilize Zeppo. So we, we know that that's a game changer for it. We would rate ourselves a three out of 10 with it in implementation so far. Um, and what we've actually done, which is pretty interesting, we usually leave one person on one project and, and I think that's flawed. So we've actually rotated to another person to do it now. Fresh set of eyes has given us a whole new perspective on it. Is a, is a quarterly thing part of the Rockefeller habits? Um, is that sort of part of your core objectives? Yes. Yep, absolutely. So this is at one of our rocks uh, is to get that sorted. And that's been a bit of a revelation to us in, all right, let's let's rotate the job roles on certain things. And we're looking at Zeppo a whole new way to what we were six months ago now and a lot more dynamic and positive with it because it as you as we retrain someone else in it, the, the product itself has evolved, the software itself has evolved. So now there's new capabilities that it has that we can take advantage of that the person who learned it previously isn't looking for the new stuff because they've learned their way. So that's been really good, and we're really excited about what Zeppo will be able to do and, and continue to support of that. You know, we've then got Trainial. So that was, you know, you need a warehouse for your policies and procedures and, and rather than give someone a 360-page document. And that's got kind of a bit of our culture piece in there, our values, uh, the basic stuff, but also the processes. And we've uh, just recently added Employment Hero. So that was really to make Kel's life easier. And there's also in there some one of our key metrics. We've got four pillars that we're really going to judge going forward with Centaur. Uh, the revenues, the profitability, the employee, 
net promoter score and our client net promoter score. So that's how we're going to judge a lot of our success. And so through that employment hero, you can send out the monthly shout out, uh, monthly happiness and things like that. So we're going to measure that. It's a much underlooked, people focus on net promoter scores, for instance, but you can make your clients happy and your people miserable. The art of the deal is to make sure that both are getting happy at the same rate. Yeah, and I think if we do a great point at the same rate, I think that's true. We've got to make sure that they're happy and engaged. And that's where the core barriers has become really important for us too. To, we've got the six core barriers up on the wall and we know what we need to achieve. And you know, we they, they become your yes, no answers. Are we, are we doing this? Yes or no? And just a quick quick sort of review. Are you located in a single site? Um, you know, how does it work? Single sites, the Palm Beach office. Uh, at this point in time, we're always looking, uh, I suppose, for for growth opportunities and to and to see where we end where we end up. Uh, so we there's obviously we've got clients online who are happy to in, to engage us that way. But the majority of our our client base they do prefer the the face to face meetings. And so that we've kind of built the the business as to what they've they've wanted in the survey responses and things like that. So it's they've been able to build Centaur collaboratively with us. And I'm just going to ask you a random question because you're probably one of the practices outside of kind of Aubrey or Donga that were right on the border. Um, how did you handle COVID? And were any of your team members on the other side of the border? Yeah. It was tough. Ke- Kelly may have crossed the border a few times when she shouldn't have, but for her, it was it was very important for her to be with the team. So it was really tough because you're sort of waiting 45 minutes. One of the benefits working here is that 15 minutes to work no matter where you live. And now it was taking 45 minutes an hour. So we gave them the option. We, we all fundamentally agreed, though, that we are all better together. The, the learning, the collaboration, the synergy is better when we're all together. And we had to actually work hard, and probably a lot of businesses had, on redefining and getting our culture back to what it was pre-COVID. We probably thought, oh, well, it'll just automatically happen. And, and we really needed to work hard on that. And it's I'm going to ask you to question that one too, be so because look, I, I've been involved in various businesses, and like everyone else, um, they all used to work together in the one spot. And then there came this moment in March 2020, and altogether, my businesses had to send 700 people um, home, and now we're bringing them back. And the real art of the deal is figuring out where this is going to land. What is going to be the new normal? So, is the new normal is not full time at home, is not full time at work? And so, what I was wondering is, how do you see your business? as far as the new normal for people being in the office and how you're running it so that you can interact with people who aren't in your office? I really think we haven't probably as an industry paid enough attention to to this. And there's- Look, don't beat us up. No one has. No one gets this one. Um, I reckon it'll be a university subject for the rest of uh, our, our lifetimes and it'll be a case study in three or four years' time. And I, I think it comes to trust. And if if there's clear job roles, clear accountabilities, clear ability to track their progress, then it doesn't really matter where they work from. So our, our power planner, Renee, one day a week, she works from home because that suits her family environment. In years gone by, we had people that would work from home because that suited them and their families. And we had 100% trust from the business perspective from that. So we, we're very flexible with that. And I think it might end up being a three and two or four and one will end up being kind of the numbers when you when you look at it. They've still got to be in the office so because you do miss if if people are out, they they do put themselves away from the team a bit. So and I, I think there's just a synergy from being all together. Yeah, look agreed. And we'll work on when we touch people culture, I suppose. So by working your business, I've got clear cadences as far as the way you run your business. It's all pretty transparent. People have got clear job descriptions, which one of those unusual scenarios is um five or six years is um, is you're actually attracting organic clients. You know, you've spoken about 100 new families coming every year, which is which is about a 20% increase in your overall business. It's actually really ambitious. The actual corporate part of your business, I mean, how are you owned today? Have you got investors? Look, we spoke off air and you mentioned, you, you know, 1.0, 2.0. And I think we're a mad agreement that you can build your engine room, your platform, be silly not to take your next step. So, you know, what's the ownership structure and what's the ambition? I, currently, I own 100% of Centaur and there'll be the people within the team that will that will buy into the business. And I suppose big, bigger than that is the, the appetite for some acquisition. And we've 
got outside investors that will contribute capital. You know, there'd be some things that we do through through that to be the succession plan for a lot of businesses that have clients similar to ours, that that ideal client, and maybe they've already got someone that they have in their business who is going to be good but couldn't afford to buy it. So they might stay within the business and be one of the key advisor there as, as we kind of come in and bring our capital and our expertise and our ecosystem infrastructure branding. Because again, with the size that we get now, we've got really good scale discounts. So if we come into a business, we can bring a lot of expertise there as well as give a better client outcome through reduced cost. Uh, and with our in-house investment capability, maybe a better investment experience. So I, I feel there's with a lot of the advisors, the shrinking advisor workforce, they, they want that really great client experience to continue that they've been amazing at. So you want to align yourself culturally with someone who honors that and will always be respectful to that as one of their core values. Look, potentially they are doing that, but they're doing that with 80 hours a week labor at the moment. Yeah. And it's, it's expensive. You know, if you're a one or two person business right now, it's very expensive and quite possibly you've also lost your love for, for what got you into the industry. And so part of my focus would be, well, how do we get you to do that thing that you love, you know, that where you're going to operate amazingly well and you're going to help people and we can take care of those headaches because we've built the we've built the back engine, the engine room effectively to be able to do that for you. If it was a drinking game, I just took a sip, well done. I don't normally get many engine rooms thrown back at me, but my subliminal program is working. Look, look, get going. <laughs> I, I try and think what would I have liked if I'm towards the end of my career or if I'm a young person, what would I want in my career? And if you can kind of build that, if I was, you know, towards the last three, four years of my career, I'd want to know my clients were taken care of because I'm still going to see them in the street sometimes. I'm still going to see them at the shop. Absolutely. And you know what? In regional and big towns, it's even more relevant because you're just going to walk past them. You know, they might be your doctor. You know, they could be your banker. They could be anyone that you know. Uh, and I think that the history of the industry and the way in which the the sales have been with the, 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 big, the big houses where they just... Offered you this amount, and then you didn't really know who the person was going to, you know, grab your clients and look after them. I just think that, you know, uh, after the exercise of, of selling in that environment, there'd be a lot of post-purchase remorse from these people anecdotally. Well, I feel we've seen that with people that have done some of those transactions, and that has been their feedback. So, I think there's that cultural alignment piece is important, and that's part of the youth of our business is you know that we're going to be able to take care of those clients. And I, I I fundamentally believe that all advisors want to help people. So that's a very important thing for us. And those big businesses that talk about, we're just going to do bolt-ons and acquisitions. Sometimes the thing we forget about is the client and the client experience. Well, let's talk about the client experience. I mean, you're, you're targeting, or well, your target clients are pre-retirees. I mean, do you do you run an SMA or an MDA? Is there already a platform? You know, what, what, what does good things for you? And, um, uh, you know, if you, if you've got Google buttons, reward them with a the mention, you know, is there any sort of direction you're heading in? Yeah. So since 2015, we, we were an early adopter of SMAs and, and managed accounts. And that's been, it was a game changer for us because we were doing it so that we wouldn't have to do ROAs, uh, which again was an efficiency game. We're always looking at how we do efficiency games and we didn't know that it would grow to be what it has been. And it's, it's been amazing for us in terms of being able to go and get our discounts with, with managers and to build best of breed solutions that everyone, you know, everyone gets the benefit from at, at day one. If we believe that X Y Z is the best fund, uh, then everyone should have it. Uh, so I suppose in there there is a bit of a view that our, our client base uh, does benefit from active management, and whereas I think there's a conversation that a lot of accumulators could do index and do really well, but in you think last year you had the U.S. shares and U.S bonds, both went down more than 10% in a year. So if that's a retiree client, that doesn't work. So we need different strategies that are going to get them through. Uh, so premium is who we built that through. So we've had a really good working relationship with them over time. Uh, and they, they know that you know, we hold them to account on things. And they've we always talk partnership about everything. And that's someone who we feel they've really partnered well with us over time. Uh, so we've been pleased with their and you know, that, that's a continued evolution. Products are always evolving, so we're always looking. And, you know, there's, it's pretty exciting times for a client right now because they're fighting for each other. They're all fighting for dollars. Yeah, look, and that's right. And look, earlier in the podcast, you mentioned that you sort of surround yourself with the professionals in the life insurance and debt space. 
But pertaining specifically to intergenerational wealth transfer and, you know, look, taking the client's children on, do you surround yourself with like an estate planning business that, that sort of complements all of these things? Uh, yeah, yes, that was our first time uh, because uh, we, again, part of our goal is to give people peace of mind. So these are the non-financial benefits that, you know, the intangibles. So we really wanted to get that to be great. And we've got a, a business now that will come into the office, see the client, um, sit down with them, fixed fee, and they really benefit from that. So although we don't make any money out of it, the clients know that we care. Yeah, look, so they're getting like a private or a family office experience, you know, they're getting, you know, your person on point, surrounding themselves with professionals. And although, you know, you're on the Gold Coast, they're really getting a very much a high street experience. So they don't necessarily have to go to Brisbane, Sydney, or Melbourne to get that kind of experience of a private wealth practice, really. Well, and this was the realization of why we had to grow because I wasn't, in, I never intentionally started and said, I want to have the biggest business in the world. But it, it kind of became that, well, the more scale we get, the more benefit we can bring to our clients' world. So that's been an evolution. Ah, uh, look, fantastic. In relation to your people, you know, I always like to ask the question, why do people join you? Why do they stay? And how do you grow together? And maybe you get a bit of an idea of how you identify talent and recruit them. This is probably every business's hardest thing to do. And we've gone through a few ways. I could probably tell you more ways that don't work than what do work. Oh, hold on. Look, give us a couple of don'ts. We've got lesson to be learned here. I think we've really got to test people out in a, in almost like a game time simulation. So we would just take people's word and we that they've been an advisor for five years and we would assume that they had that knowledge. We would assume that they would know how to do it our way. With CSOs, we might assume that they would know how to use the platforms that we use. We would assume that they would know how to do the processes. So go, going forward, we've really went through, all right, well, once we... Once we know that, articulate that they will fit our culture and we like their attitude. So that's that's just meet and greet. Kelly does all of that nowadays and she's got her question sets and goes through that. We're not, we haven't done yet the profiling, uh, but we will uh, based off, you know, our, our team's profiles and what will work there. We utilize things like the 16 personalities and things like that, just so we know each other's work styles and personal, but go, going through that to really build out, then using the case studies, they, they're the things we should have done better. Oh, look, and look now, now you've mentioned your company culture. What's told to you is is the word culture gets thrown around a fair bit. And, you know, it's something above what's in actual yogurt. So what, what's, 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 where, how do you sum up you, your company culture? Culture's everything. And it starts from the leader. I've learned. I feel, yeah, you slap, you slap your core values on the wall doesn't really mean anything. I, I think from our perspective, we, we let our culture actually falter during COVID and, and probably we had things creep in and we didn't really address them quick enough. So Colt Cross is leading at the front. He is taking accountability, responsibility, having fun. Like I think people confuse culture with let's go do fun stuff. And our culture is accountability, responsibility, leading clients on the journey and working together collaboratively. We, we're big on team. We're big on client first and we reward that too. So in people's bonuses and remuneration, there it's there is a culture score that that's there, so they actually know that not only do we talk the talk, we we reward we reward the work too. So if you're doing that, even if you don't hit financial numbers, you're still going to get a reward because you're living our values, you're living our culture. And I think the more more you lead it, and you've you've got to be at the front of that as as the leader of the business, uh, the more people follow. And doing things the way we went on a conference last week, you know, we we do our monthly massages, things like that are those nice to haves, but just show that they care, that we care about them as people. And I think culturally, like any good team or sports team, it's not necessarily about having a team of superstars. It's having a superstar team and knowing everyone, that's also culture contributes to everyone knowing their role. Like go back to Jim Collins, right seat on the bus, like the right people in the right seats. And if they know that they've got clear job accountability, they know how they succeed and that feels good as well. And that brings positivity. And I think also having those crucial conversations quick when there's someone's butt needs to be kicked, let's just get it over with quick and stopping. We call it the no triangles. So I'm not going to talk about you to him and don't usual. And let's just have that conversation quick. And that's, that's where our- they, they used to call that gossiping you. So we, we really try to remove that. If there's a, if there's a problem, someone makes a mistake. Let's all get and talk about it quick. 
because everyone try, we've got a really smart team we've got really good people so we know if someone makes a mistake it's a mistake so let's let's just fix it so i'm going to ask you a question you who holds you to account uh my children and my wife uh, <laughs> uh look shout out to Anne. i'm actually looking at her smiley face on the website and we uh we both disclosed earlier that both of our respective partners have a background in psychology so that says more about us than them so yeah what do you mean by that i suppose what's your your sense check because you said you are a bit of a dreamer and you've got this vision and you are rolling things out you 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 have the foresight to make sure that you're tethering how you operate to some pretty successful business structures whether they be jim collins or whoever but deep down who holds you to account uh deep down it in our world it would be the one page strategic plan uh and then kelly will be the one saying okay where where are we at with that uh, but but at this point really they that's a fluffy answer and that's probably something if we're very honest we do need to address and that's where you know you see a lot of other people have the business coaches we've gone in and out with business coaches over the over the years um when we've needed it we've used it and when we've kind of not needed it we've we've canned it but really yeah well i ruined my business coach uh my business coach was dave garney who ended up becoming my business partner so yeah there's there's one less business coach but probably one more successful businessman yeah but uh, the, the scale the scale up framework works really well for me and that that is what i think actually can hold ceos to account and i think you know when you get to sort of 3.0 when you know some of your team members are equity holders, and you've got you know investors, you've got board meetings, you know you, you're looking at return on investment. It's just a natural progression. And uh, while I'm on that, you know, you mentioned that um, you've got uh, in people's sort of employment structure, you've got a, a, a you know an item on culture. Um, and is there you know like a, an NPS or an EPS? Or there's like an employee satisfaction. And is what you're using is employment hero? Is that what you're using for like scaffolding is, or is this just early days? No, that, that is helping us and that's everything we're building, we're building so we can scale. So that, that's a key bit of infrastructure for us and those and, and just having data points all in the one spot. Yeah, but how, how do you say, look, you mentioned you do team awards and I, I did, uh, you know, you let it slip that uh, you have a monthly mash charge, which... Um, Look, uh, taken out of context, probably not going to fly. But I understand it's a, it's a, it's good that you've got um, uh, people who are, who are motivated. Um, but the businesses, I suppose, that um, where people aren't physically in front of them, how do you ensure that culture is a one dream? Oh, sorry, is a one team, one dream? And you know, what's the common tethers that you use? I think that's a great question. From our perspective, the one team, one dream kind of approach means that we're all crystal clear in what the goals are and we just celebrate ourselves. We, you know, even on through Employment Hero, the shout out, you know, we do the employee of the month where we will dial in the people who aren't in the office. So we've got it this afternoon, uh, employee of the month. And, you know, that certificate, we've got the trophy and at the end of the year, we've just got the most, it's almost like a brown low uh, that they can win that. And with that, there's a, you know, we've given them a, a cash prize, but also they've got to use that to go away and do something nice for themselves. But every every month there'll be that, and you know, our people who have been offsite have won it, uh, and our people on site have won it, and everyone gets to vote. So it's we definitely everyone's part of the same team. We don't we, if we talk about the guys over in overseas, they're our team. They're not the guys. They're our outsourced or our BBPs or our. They're just our team, and those guys are as good a teammates as you could ever want. Christian talks so much smack about basketball, uh, you know, and Dan's about to have her first baby and we're excited. And for those guys, you know, we'll, if we're having a, a strategy day or a town hall, we'll buy them lunch over there. So we've got the ability to facilitate those things, which just incorporates them part of our team. We've got another uh, group, uh, another financial planning group in Australia uh, who use a lot of the VBPs. Um, so we've got our team next to, close to their team so they can feel, who get that synergy and learn from each other so you know it, it really works well when you focus on it i think that's the one thing we've realized and if you look at our business like our first people that's ahead of anything is people in culture so from my perspective that's our most important resource that's the thing we're really trying to grow grow out i feel the advisors could easily manage around 100 million dollars in the pod structure uh, if you look at our our structure going forward uh, so th that that wouldn't be difficult. And as we grow the diamond teams through there, 
that probably, you know, gets to, you know, 250 million with, with teams underneath you and, and synergies. And if you look at uh, the quality of advice review, you know, maybe no SOAs, maybe things like that, some streamlined efficiencies coming in. There's some good software solutions that are there that can model things quicker. We're, we're going to become a better business that. I think EBIT really entry line should be 30%. Um, and you can get higher through synergy. And with that, you know, you can then make your profit pools for your team. So you can really individually incentivize your pods and your team so that with our, we had a whole team remuneration by our bonus structure and that we had two advisors that did really, really well and one advisor that didn't do well at all. And the team missed out on that. So that wasn't fair. So we, we've, the, the remuneration, the profit pools, we've talked to our team and said, look, this is dynamic. We're still figuring it out, but we'll be very transparent with you about it, about the profitability of the business, about those four pillars, what we're trying to achieve. So they know that they're going to re- win, but only if the team wins. Look, I think transparency is the key, you know, and we can all be a bit vulnerable and um, and I'll be vulnerable as well, you know. So when you're looking at a profit number, I sometimes think, uh, you know, what we've historically done is you're always building, right? Are, are you are you, are you filling a cup or, or are you building a capacity cup? And and given the fact you've made the act decision not to go and build your own estate plan law firm, not to go and build your own debt firm, not to go and build your own life insurance firms means that you're not crop subsidizing. So you're not sort of dipping into one profit pool to d- pay for the other. And I did that for years because I wanted to build um, potentially – also, there wasn't a big culture 15 years ago sharing clients between professional services – and look, the whole reason I've been involved with Phil Ensemble over the you know the last couple of years was that I wish there was an environment like this when I was coming through where the like-minded people could share advice and you could build trust with colleagues. So, does that resonate with you? You know, you are being quite hyper-specific, and um, you know, ultimately, some profits should drop out. A hundred percent, and it's it's I want to be the best at what I do, and I want my team to be the best at what we do, and we realise that we can't be the best at everything. We tried. And I don't think the client's got a great outcome. So, or as good as they could have if we had have outsourced. And giving up on those things, you know, the we were going to grow the wealth accumulator space, which is a really natural niche for us given our age. But we, we weren't great at lending. We weren't great at insurance. So from that perspective, you know, it's all right, well, let's find people who are. And definitely that will now increase the profitability. We Where we went from, we lowered our profitability when we scaled up our team. We went with newcomers and we invested in them. So we went from great profitability to really low profitability. And and that was fine because we knew it's almost like those valleys of death they talk about. And we know we've got to spend that to grow, but then really assess, okay, how's how's it working? What do we need to, you know, what do we need to change and be quick, quick to move when things aren't working. And look, just using real language, when we spoke um uh, off off air earlier and I sort of said well you've got a pretty good thing going on do you really need anyone like are you looking to for people and talent and you said look you know what ideally we want to have great people in our firm and you mentioned that getting great people you can always train them but you also said that that you, you're after um, if anyone's looking out there in in your geographical area or even beyond for that sort of uh, there might be a one or two person operator and in front of them over the next five to ten years is a big valley of death you know, they're either going to make the decision and go through that, and they've got to strap in for lower profits for five, six, seven years in order to come out the other end, or alternatively, and increasingly, they could start to learn to work with a practice such as yours, bring in their two or three people, and, and, and avoid avoid that, that big valley of death, which some people don't come out of. And um, we've seen that, you know, massive production in, in advisor numbers, and I'm going to win saying that, yes, the education standards we're one part of it. But geez, I, I'd like to actually overlay that with the people who just couldn't make a fist of it with their engine room. The hardest thing in the world is to grow an engine room. It really is. And you've got to make a lot of mistakes before you figure it out. And if I reflect, you know, it's 13, 14 years Centaur has been running and it, I only now this far into it feel that I've got it right. And I've, I know there's still a lot to figure out, but my team now is the best it's been. We're all aligned. We haven't had that before. And the the cost, the how do you do the marketing, the compliance, the investment expertise, how are your clients getting the best outcome? Because what the client judges you by really is the service experience. And so if we can get people to just be focused on that and take care of everything else, uh, I, don't, I know if that had been presented to me all those years ago, 
it would have been really attractive and your profitability would have been great and you would your worry I always say like for my advisors I want their worry to be their client that that's and you should worry about that but don't be worried about HR stuff don't be worried about the compliance you know the AFSL requirements don't be worried about the necessarily you know all these other things the stuff that gets in the way and distracts you from your main keep the main thing the main thing and I think there's for like-minded businesses i think there's a real synergy that could come from that and uh look um one final question that was basically um your agent had this in, in your rider um is uh your predictions for the following nba season just a winner can't go past golden state warriors okay and uh we're gonna, we're, i won't i won't end on that i'll let everyone have a collective uh, sigh um at, at that one but but you it's it's early in the morning i knew this would be a, a great podcast you very really, so you've got this mix of you enthusiastic, but you're also honest. You know, throughout this this podcast, you've you've actually opened up and said, "Here's the things that that didn't work, and you've learned from that." And I think that um, people are, are, are attracted to people who understand their failings. And I think you know, shiny 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 stickers in financial planning just aren't are the future. And and having that authentic, um, continuous um, kind of uh, dialogue is a part of it. Um, we're going to put a lot of links. He, he was prolific in, in, in dropping the, the tools that he uses in this. We're also probably going to put a bit of an overall uh, sort of HR perspective of the business. If you want to get in touch with Hugh, um, you can follow him through the Ensemble one. But, but Hugh, look, on behalf of uh, you and your team in your engine room, I'd like to thank you for your words of wisdom. Cheers, mate. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers.